So we're here at TEDMED 2012 and we're talking about a big issue, big in terms of impact on society and big in terms of numbers, and that's the demographic tsunami that's coming. Dr. Petsko, could you describe to us what that tsunami looks like and what it impacts, how it's going to impact us? Sure. So there, right now there are 5 million Americans with Alzheimer's disease. That's a big number. How big is 25 million? Because in about 40 years, it's going to be 25 million with Alzheimer's disease. And worldwide, in 40 years, about 100 million Alzheimer's patients. And if you project that out to the end of the century, by 2100, 300 million Alzheimer's patients worldwide. That's about the population of the United States today. And in terms of economic impact, it's colossal. By the middle of the century, every dollar spent on Medicare will be spent on Alzheimer's wow. disease and there'll be no money left over for anything else. And Lisa, believe it or not, it's even bigger than that because as you said so astutely in your lecture yesterday, for every patient there's a caregiver mm. or two or three. And so uh, the, uh, this is just a you know, tremendous societal issue. And I, th I think of this, Lisa, as the unacceptable future. Mm. That what we really have to do is think about interventions. What can we do to stop this disease? Disease. What can we do to delay the onset? What can we do to improve the symptoms? These are the goals that as scientists we have to change the unacceptable future. So if we see this coming, why aren't we doing anything about it? I mean, just look at the math. I mean, Medicare is a major issue. We're talking about deficits and debt and payments and the role of government. If we see it coming, why aren't we doing something? Well, there are things being done, of course. There are organizations and individuals who are trying to spread the word, but I think it's an interesting question why the sense of urgency isn't out there right. about this coming tsunami. Right. I think there are a number of reasons. One is the sort of stigma attached to mental illness right. in general. Alzheimer's patients become invisible real quick and their caregivers just, are, are so just consumed. so exhausted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, and that's a big problem. We uh, say we say, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Right. In this case, they're out of mind and therefore they're out of sight. So so the so the metaphor works in exactly the opposite well, way. Well, is it possible that it's just too depressing? I mean, you deal with end of life issues. The last thing I want to deal with as a thirty eight year old by person is thinking about my death right now. So are, is there something that needs to happen in society that prepares us to think about that in a new way so we make different decisions about what we invest in or personal health choices? Yes, but I, I do think, but you know, we're so schizophrenic about all this mm. in the country. I, I actually think the uh, an organization that should be dealing with this is AARP, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, because many of us in AARP are caring for our aging parents. You're in the sandwich we're generation. We're in the sandwich generation. Right. And I think but, we have but, you know, sorry. that's not the marketing messages you get typically from, so you get from, from, from the, the retirement. <laughs> that's right. And right. I, think, I think we have to see Alzheimer's disease as a kind of algebra of a lifelong process, as opposed to yeah. just a disease that's Wait, strikes was that an algebra of, of a lifelong, lifelong process? process. Okay. It has to do with your lifelong exercise habits, whether you have diabetes, whether you have hypertension, whether you take care of your cholesterol levels. All of these things will contribute to whether or not the person has a high risk for Alzheimer's disease at the end of life. So we really need an educational program that will begin early in life, will continue those health habits throughout life, and will reduce the risk in the end of life. I remember, I remember watching my grandmother do crosswords every week, and I know she was doing it partially because she didn't want to get Alzheimer's. It was like the anti-Alzheimer crosswords. Word. Yeah. This, this is incredibly important, right? Because one of the other reasons that this disease is ignored by so many people is people don't understand it's a disease. It's something you can actually yes. prevent and cure. It's thought to be an inevitable consequence right. of aging. You just get That's old. Not true. They call it old timers right. sometimes, right? You yes, can right. structure your life in such a way that your risk is much lower. We need to co brand this disease because this is a disease of the patient and the caregiver. Mm. I'm living, my, my uh, mother-in-law is 92, has Alzheimer's, and my wife and I are as much, have the disease as much as she does in the sense of our caregiving responsibilities. I just lost uh, my aunt who was 104 years old and who lived with Alzheimer's for about 14 years. Wow. So. Uh, mm. This is a disease of the person and of for the caregivers who are responsible. I worked at the Alzheimer's Association for a while as a volunteer coordinator and I was always moved when the caregiver would come in looking thin and haggard. Right. It was a huge impact. So exponentially you're you're right. So what is the 
What is the prognosis for Alzheimer's? I mean, it feels to me like there isn't a movement around finding a cure or helping the, helping the caregivers. What do we have to do to sort of bring this into light and really find some solutions for this? And there are a lot of small things that can be done that haven't been done either. South Korea actually has a program where in high school there's a required course, everybody has to take it, on caring for people with wow. dementia. Wow. We don't do anything right. like that. Wow. Flexible time, job sharing for right. caregivers, things that would make it possible for caregivers to have something like a normal life. We don't do that either. Has there been an economic number uh, indicated or represented? What's the cost of Alzheimer's on America? Not just for the person with it, but caregivers losing work, losing, losing productivity hours. Ballpark figure is $200 billion for wow. the disease and another $200 billion in lost income and other things for caregivers. Right. Right. Total of $400 billion. Well, so and and to spend $600 million on Alzheimer's research. Wow. A drop in the bucket. Wow. And the projection is that by 2050, as Dick said, when there, as Greg said, when there are 100 million victims, it'll be a trillion dollars a year. A trillion dollars. It's a major That's economic a impact. Cost. Yeah, exactly. That's a direct and, cost. And, and, and think about what that means. Every dollar spent on Medicare by then will have to be spent on Alzheimer's disease. Right. There won't be a dime left for any other disorder. Well, what I find fascinating about this demographic crunch is we have a lot of people going into retirement at normal retirement age, right. mid-60s, right? Your work, Dr. Cummings, looks at what retirement does to the brain. Could you talk about that? Well, it's just, uh, I think, a common observation that there is a kind of use it or, or, or lose it opportunity for dementia prevention, uh, and that the more we are socially engaged, the more we are mentally active, uh, and this also, by the way, goes for physical activity, the more active we are, the less likely we are, or the later we, we will develop the dementia syndrome. Quick response, one word and then a sentence to support it. Are you an optimist or pessimist, pessimist in general about America's health and health care? Optimist or pessimist? About health and health care? In America. Oh, I'm optimistic, but in, in the long run, but uh, not so optimistic in the short run. Dr. Petsko. I'm a pessimist because a pessimist only gets pleasant surprises. Oh, good. So you have low expectations <laughs> that can only. Okay. Okay, Dr. Uh, I'm an optimist that eventually we're going to, fall to solve the translational problems that have to do with getting the great science that's evolving into better care for patients. Well, I want to thank all of you, not only for doing this interview and for being at TEDMED, but for what you do for the country and the world. It's, it's really, it's hard work, and thank you for doing it. And take care of yourselves in the process. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. Thank you, thank take you. care. Thank you.